And welcome back to the Pride of Detroit POD cast. Um, I'm a little out of breath. I'm running the Twitch stream here. We had to thank everyone who was gifting subs here. But let's really quickly get back into it. Because a lot's been happening over the past calendar week so much that I'm, I am I kind of lost track of everything. Uh, we could keep talking about Hard Knocks and the draft, but I really want to talk about the return of Jared Davis. He is coming back to Detroit. He The Lions re-signed their former first-round pick from 2017. Uh, speaking of which, you know, we just talked about Philly, me, Ryan, being there for that draft. So Jared Davis comes full circle back to Detroit. I think it's a little bit of a different return for Jared Davis. And I, I think... Jeremy, how would you say fan... I, I've got a point on this, so I guess I will ask you straight up. How would you say fan reaction has been to the return of Jared Davis? I, I would actually say it's a little more positive than I was expecting. Um, given given the Lions have you know not been very aggressive in free agency and returned a lot of guys from, from last year's squad, I, I kind of assumed that bringing back a guy who more or less failed in his four years here uh, was going to bring in more negative attention. And listen, it, it has. There's certainly some people that are upset that they aren't doing more to improve the linebacker room, and I understand why it's not a good linebacker room. Um, and they, they brought back everyone except for maybe the guy that played the best at linebacker last year in Jalen Reeves Maven. Uh, so bring back Jared Davis, understandably overall an unpopular move, but the reason it was better than expected is that people kind of love Jared Davis in, in the person that he is. And he does fit this culture to a T and that's why we probably shouldn't be surprised that this happened in that we, we heard uh, we heard Dan Campbell say last year, like he loved this dude. He turned on the tape. Um, he talked about when he was scouting the Lions as part of the Saints and said, like, we got to put a helmet on this guy or he's going to split open the chin of one of our dudes. And so I, it, I would not be surprised at all if the Lions really wanted Jared Davis back last year. But the Jets kind of handed him the bag. I mean, we all saw that contract that, that, that Robert Sala gave Jared Davis and we're like, wow, he paid that much. Yeah, I'm guessing and- the reason was that the Lions were probably trying to bid at, for him, too. But they just they didn't have the cap space last year. So. He's back, and uh, he, he fits what they want in terms of the, the kind of person they want. question is, can the Lions unlock the player potential that he has? Yeah, he was middling last year for the Jets, too. Not great grades. He, I think he, he was bad. He, he was bad. <laughs> like, I think he got – I think the best we could say is he got, like, what, a 66 PFF grade on pass rush, on his pass rush elements. So it's kind of – I think that's what we're expecting out of him right now is kind of a – a role player for like two down, a two down linebacker, someone who can come in and just for packages to just, you know, just bring the house. But I think that, I, I think that the reaction is like, I, I'm glad that people are coming around and being a little more positive, but I would say, I think a lot of the negative reaction is just kind of the devil, you know, at this point, he fits with a lot of the moves the Lions have made over the past year where they've been these reclamation projects like Charles Harris it just happens to be that Jared Davis ha- like was drafted by the Lions in the past. If he'd been drafted by like Tennessee or Jacksonville, I don't think this would be a problem at all for many people. It'd be a problem in the sense that maybe it would fit with the larger problem of people want to see more out of Lions free agency, which isn't going to happen. Not this year, not in year two of a rebuild, but it, it fits with where they've gone to try to get reclamation projects. And yeah, Jared Davis in the Jets was a reclamation project last year, but first over, I mean, first round picks usually get a couple swings at the bat after they've bombed out for people to try to unlock their potential. Wouldn't you say, Ryan? Yeah, I I think it's an interesting case with Jared Davis for a few reasons. One, I, I think for the Lions and what this does for them in terms of their perception I mean, I can't think of a move that is more, if you know what Jared Davis went through, you know, getting drafted when Caldwell was, was his head coach to having gone through like the entire Matt Patricia era to finally moving on to the jets for him to come back to Detroit after all the crap that he went through in Detroit, I think is a, is a glowing mark on Detroit in terms of the kinds of players that they can attract now, because that shows that there's actual change happening um it with this with this front office with this coaching staff I mean we saw kind of like got that feeling with Darren Fells and him coming back but like having Jared Davis come back I think is a huge eye-opener for anybody who is in in tune with things during the Matt Patricia era but I think specifically for Jared Davis I think that I 
think that there's a lot of opportunity here because I'm not taking it as coach speak. Uh, what Robert Sala said um, to the the press during the the AFC coaches breakfast on Monday that they had, but like Sala couldn't have had nicer things to say about Jared Davis. Like last season, working his tail off in OTAs and training camp, and then he ends up suffering an ankle injury that wipes out half of his season. And Salah really thinks that he came back a little bit too early just because he wanted to be playing football. That's the kind of competitor he is. And this is what Jared Davis talked about in his press conference, or I guess his reintroductory press conference, we should call it, right, Jeremy? Like he talked <laughs> yeah. about like having to put that governor on himself for for the better of maybe the team and himself, kind of learning to like dial that competitiveness back um to to be a to be a you know a more productive football player. So Yeah. I, I think it. I think it's all really interesting, right? Um, because it, it, if if you listen to what Robert Sala said, and of course he's not going to throw his own player under the bus, um, but it really seemed to. He really really seemed to suggest that all of his struggles, all of his struggles last year, were because of that ankle injury. And yeah. I, I, I maybe I, here's the thing: like, I am not going to fall into this trap again. I am not going to fall into this trap that maybe this is the year that Jared Davis turns it around and becomes a first round pick. I'm just not. I'm sorry. Like, I, I saw enough of him where I, I, my eyes don't lie. But let me run through the reasons why it could be better this time. One is the injuries are, are essentially gone. He's not 100% yet, but he, he's essentially there. And, and like you said, he's now come with the lesson where I'm not going to push it because that's not good for me. It's not good for the team. It's not good for my future. He's, he's come with that lesson. He's come with a lot of lessons. I thought, I thought his press conference was fascinating. Came with the lesson of, you know, not putting football as his number one necessarily, like learning the work-life balance a little bit more, not putting all that pressure on himself. He's learned to kind of block out some of the, the, the distractions from, from media, from fans. He, he admits that it, it has affected him, but he's, he's learned how to control that better. He fits better in this defense. Dan Campbell three weeks ago was at the, at the NFL combine saying it's a completely different scheme. It's a completely different, it's even a it, different base. Right. And, and he was at the NFL combine saying like, we want our linebackers to be running free. We want the defensive line to let these guys run downhill and make plays. And that's what Jared Davis is best at, where he doesn't have to think. He just runs. It's not shedding blocks. He just runs and tackles. And more importantly, and, you have coordinators and coaches who aren't going to be like, hey, we want you to play coverage. He might at times. He'll he, have might, to. he might have to, but I'm just but, saying, like, he's not going <clears> to. <throat> like, this galaxy brain right. shit where he's being asked to start and play coverage is not right. going is probably not going to happen we'll see i mean and and the, the other kind of fascinating point about this is that he's being coached now by a guy he used to line up next to and kelvin shepherd kelvin shepherd used to be a linebacker while jared davis was also a linebacker for this team so i think all that's kind of interesting i i, I don't think it's going to amount to much i mean they, they, we don't have contract terms yet but you, you have to imagine they're not going to be paying enough for him to be, you know, penciled in as, a, as even a starter. I mean, like, we're going to talk about Chris Borden in, in, in a minute here, but I think Chris Borden and him are kind of on entering at the same levels. And and Jared Davis said, like, that's kind of how he prefers it because it, I, I, another fascinating quote, and I'm going to butcher it here, he's, you know, being at the top is not easy. Being a, that top first-round pick with, with all the expectations on your shoulder is not easy. But where, what he loves, he loves the climb. He loves getting to that moment. He loves trying to prove it every minute. And – that's that's where I think this whole offseason is centered about. It's about getting guys who want to compete, getting guys that are going to, you know, iron sharpens iron type of thing where the lines don't have a starter linebacker in their group, but they have a bunch of guys capable of starting. And they're hoping that as they scratch and claw for playing time, that's going to raise a level of competition. And that's what they're hoping out of Jerry yeah, Davis. At the end of the day, for me with Jared Davis, he keeps coming back to this wouldn't be so much of a of, of a of a thing that people would like we'd have to talk about and kind of muddy over too much if he hadn't been drafted by the Lions. That's it. That's what that's what it comes down to is I see all the same arguments and as much as we I feel like we have to do some apology for him just because an apology isn't always bad, but sometimes it has to be done because he had just had such a bad reputation leaving Detroit. But again, if he had been drafted by any other team fans wouldn't be acting like this because fans love to hate on the devil. They know they, they, that that's why this free agency is rumbling. So many rustling, so many, the jimmies of so many lions fans, because it's not new, fresh toys. It's a lot of guys that they've already known new, fresh toys. You don't have criticisms on new, fresh toys. 
you are more than willing to try to pick apart and try to find the upside a lot more than guys who you've seen here and know here and you just want to get rid of them because you just you, you're, you're tired and you've seen them for and you've watched them for 16 17 games a year it's yeah it's yeah. it's no it's no different than last <clears throat> it's no different than i mean even a signing that they made um you know last season like with charles harris you know charles harris comes from another team but he's a former first round pick coincidentally enough taken right after uh jared davis i think in the 2017 draft which is kind of funny um but the the thing about jared davis that i'm most excited about is that this guy was on the precipice of quitting football like he thought about giving football up before he you know before he left detroit and went and signed with the new york jets and said that he felt revitalized by going to the jets so I want to say that there is, I think there is something to Jared Davis and I'm not saying he's a starter. I'm not saying that he's going to be the best linebacker of your group, but like there's something about his effort level that I think coaches love. And I think that that totally makes him a Dan Campbell guy. So I'm just excited to see what he's going to do in a new regime. And yeah, it it, my my, maybe my favorite thing about Jared Davis is that he is a dog chasing cars, man. Like that guy (laughs) is all over the field at all times. And not, I mean, a, another cool, interesting wrinkle is that he reunites with Alex Anzalone from their right. college days at Florida. So, yeah, it'll All be right. fun. Let's All right. move on. I, I got to bounce. I, okay, I got to bounce out. At this okay, point, but Ro- Jeremy's got to go. Jeremy's got to go, and then we'll keep. We'll talk a little bit about some other free agency signings here, and then we'll move on here. So, thank you, Jeremy. Go, go enjoy uh, Rod Wood. Go enjoy right. Wood. Later, guys. <laughs> All right, so uh, Chris Hughes, Mike Hughes, Mike Chris Hughes. Board. Excuse me, excuse me. Chris Board, Mike Hughes. I'm making them the same guy in my head. So let's talk about Mike Hughes. All right, let's start there because I think that this is kind of. I, I think this is a good segue from the Jared Davis talk. And to your point, Chris, Jared Davis wouldn't be coming in with this reputation built in as a you know a. a an absolute bust of a first round pick, right? Like I, I think that because he comes from Detroit where we had a chance to see him play and not meet that level of production that's expected with a first round pick, he isn't thought of as this reclamation project like Mike Hughes is. And I think Mike Hughes had a, he had a good season in Kansas city. Uh, I think he was ranked like the 17th cornerback according to PFF. Um, but you know, he doesn't come without his, his warts. You know, he gave up eight touchdowns last season. Uh, That's something that's not included in his PFF grade. Uh, You look at some of the other statistics with him, and it's very much, it's very much like betting on Charles Harris. I think Um, he has, you know, he has one good season to his name, and I, I, I'm fine with it from a depth standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. How do you feel about Mike Hughes? I it didn't move the bar much for me. Like, again, as you say, it's a depth, it's a depth thing, but then it fits, it fits the model of what a lot of lines are going on. It's guys who have some good upside, but have had some warts. I love the word you're using there warts because warts suck. I've had them before in the past and they're one of the worst things to ever get. Um, well there's, there's worse, but you, you, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't get like a wart is just awful. Why, why am I on this tangent? Either way, like it's, it's something to fill out a roster. It's to build depth. It's someone who can like conceivably fight for a position in camp. And if nothing else, it gets you to 53 men on your roster, but it's not someone who's going to be an all time contributor. You're trying to save that for guys coming out of the draft. You're trying to save that for guys who are either that you already know what they can do or you're looking for new guys to come in the draft. This this team is still, and I have to keep preaching the patience to people, this team is still really in a very infant stage coming out of a point where they had just bom- been bombed to hell by the last regime. And I don't think it's sunk in, even in year two, I don't think it's sunk in for a lot of people. So that's what it is for Hughes. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, Chris Board, though, I think that's more of a special teams pick up more than anything. Again, like the linebacker unit isn't great for Detroit, but you do still need some guys to fill it out. And I think the Lions lost some key contributors this free agency with um, special teams. So signing a guy like Board is a good way to get some of that depth on special teams back. 
Yeah, I, he comes in and he immediately replaces, if not, I think, upgrades Jalen Reeves-Maben from from the standpoint of special teams ace, one of the best in the league, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to what he does on special teams. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I think it remains to be seen what he can do when he's given more responsibilities on defense, when he's given more snaps. Uh, last season he had a – career high for snaps uh, with 337. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how much bigger of a role the lions have uh, in mind for Chris board. Uh, just because, you know, up until this point, it's been Alex Anzalone, now Jared Davis uh, and Chris board just before that. So, you know, they have other depth pieces like Sean Dion Hamilton, but they don't really have anybody that stands out as this player is going to be a starter. You know, even Derek Barnes doesn't really kind of elicit that kind of uh, confidence or anything like that, where a lot of people I still think are looking towards the draft and saying, Oh, the, the lions can pick up a linebacker and that person can immediately come in and start and, and fix the linebacking corpse. I think it's going to need more than one fix. This is the one part of the, this is the one part of the defense where I'm like, what are we, uh, it needs some bigger help eventually. I just don't know where it's going to come from. Right. We don't know where it's going to come from, but to, to, to my point, like the last time the lions put a bunch of expectations and responsibilities on the shoulder of a first round linebacker, it was Jared Davis. It was Jared Davis. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, it's their depth pieces. Yeah. And I, I, this, this kind of goes into our, into our topic for the next segment too. I think, schematically I, I know the lions talked well about moving to a four, three base, and I'm sure that's going to be important on how this team approaches linebackers and probably takes some of the emphasis off linebackers a little bit, just because that's been, I mean, and maybe this is kind of the shift, the shift, right? Like it felt like the lions moved to a three, four base. Cause they just didn't have a lot of good, you know, linemen up front, um, defensive linemen up front. And now it's kind of the opposite problem is just the, the linebacker unit has just finally been bombed to hell. So, but, and at the same time, I mean, we'll talk about this in our draft segment too. Um, I saw a great article today about Kyle Hamilton and kind of the evolving role of the safety where safety help is kind of becoming more ubiquitous. And maybe that helps with some of the, you know, we talked about the demands of linebackers doing coverage plays. I don't think that's going to be much of an issue um, in the future. If you invest more in like safeties to do more help alongside your, your cornerbacks. So I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I'm still trying to figure out the defense. I'm not a smart person at the end of the day. And like the defense is the defense. It was, it was whatever. Yeah. I, I think it's <clears throat> the lines have put a lot of contingency plans in place. Mm -hmm. They don't really have anything that seems, that seems like a surefire upgrade or seems like a, a surefire thing at this point in the offseason when it comes to a lot of uh, the holes that they had going into the offseason. And it's a byproduct of not overspending in free agency. So I, I just want to remind every people that the Lions do have nine draft picks. They have an awful lot of draft picks to to help supplement mm -hmm. some of these needs immediately and then some of these needs as, as the team continues to build. Yeah, there's going to be another first-round draft pick in 2023. We really can't lose – sight of that and who knows what other kind of trades are made between here and now i know and you know what the nice thing too is ryan is the rest of the league because this is a copycat league is moving towards the less need f them picks i'm not saying the yeah. lions should do that but i'm saying other teams are doing that which then means mm -hmm. that the lions can kind of reap the benefits if they try to if they try to you know be sellers at some point and get some more, I mean, even on the second level market, they will probably get more benefit back if they are like either moving down or moving up or, you know, trading away someone like that, that, that kind of, that, that kind of market benefits the lions because F them picks only really works when you're on the doorstep. I don't think it's works as like an all time mentality. It, it's kind of, it's, it, it's interesting, right? Like we've almost traded away, trust the process for F them picks, but I think both are acceptable solutions when you're just in different parts of your team building process. And right now the lions are kind of in the, we need to rebuild this bombed out building process. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that's what Brad Holmes has recognized, right? Like if he's taken anything from the, the less need <clears throat> kind of uh, blueprint, it's that, 
the the draft pick has a value whether or not it's used on a player and an unknown or mm-hmm. if it's used on a known commodity like he has with Jalen Ramsey and he has with Von Miller and the other players that he's gone to to acquire with those draft picks Matthew Stafford you know so I, I I'm encouraged by the fact that the Lions are are building the draft capital because look at the way that Brad Holmes and, and I don't know, we're, we're going to talk about the draft here on the other side of the segment. But the one thing that I want to highlight real quick is Brad Holmes has done an incredible job of uh, accumulating these draft picks because he knocked it out of the park with letting Kenny Galladay walk and, you know, playing the compen- compensatory, 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 compensatory. compensatory. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One word I can say apparently. Yeah, I was stuck between compensation and compensatory, but you know, playing that game and getting those additional draft picks, and now the Lions are going to have potential minority uh, coaches as potential, you know, head coaches, and and receiving compensatory picks with that because they've you know put together an incredibly adept uh, coaching staff, and and you know those coaches will eventually get you know promoted, and the Lions will benefit from that. So, I'm. This draft is really big, though, Chris, and I know we want to talk about the the number two pick on the other side of this segment. Let's do it. Let's take a quick break. We're up, we're up against it, so let's take a quick break. We're going to talk about the draft. I know that's your home, and it's my home, and I feel like we're going to have dueling takes here now very soon because I'm starting to see the stars align for my guy, and you're starting to see the stars align for your guy, so this is a very exciting time for all of us. Meet us on the other side of the break when uh, when we go full Billy Joel dueling pianos. Is that is that where okay? So I want to make sure we're going that way and not Will Smith and Chris Rock. Yeah, I I'm not planning on hitting you, Chris. <laughs> we'll be right back on the Pride of Detroit PUD cast. <laughs> 